Okay, this is Concept One Notes and for our ecology unit, and we are going to be talking about just an introductory, introductory, excuse me, um, material on ecology, just to kind of get us set up for the rest of the unit because this is a big one and this is going to take us through until the end of the year and final exam review stuff. So. First, what is ecology? It is a study of relationships. Relationships between two organisms um, or between an organism and its environment. So I love these two pictures. Um, you know, this last one's kind of silly, but it's true. You know, we see some really, we're going to learn about some really cool relationships. So, um, before we can even get started, we need to understand what it means to be alive because an organism is a single living thing. So we need to understand what it means to be alive. So there's some criteria in order to be considered alive. There's kind of six conditions that have to be met in order to be considered a living thing. First, you have to be made of cells. It doesn't matter if you're made of one cell and you're a unicellular organism like bacteria or you're made of multiple cells and, and like trillions of cells like humans and you're multicellular. It doesn't matter, you just have to be made of cells. And you remember from our cells unit, we learned that cells are the most basic unit of life. And so that kind of makes sense, that kind of connects. Two, you have to have DNA or RNA as your genetic material. And we know humans, we actually have DNA and RNA, but some organisms only have one of those. Um, specifically prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus. Um, so it's not as necessary for them to have to make um, the different smaller copies and all that jazz. But anyway, you have to have nucleic acids as your genetic material. Third, and some people kind of split this up. I kind of put it into one thing. You have to be able to both grow, meaning become larger and develop, as well as reproduce. So producing offspring. Now, reproduction can either be sexual or asexual. Remember that sexual reproduction is just means that it takes two organisms to make the offspring. Whereas asexual, um, offspring can arise from a single parent. We actually can do kind of sexual processes and asexual to make actual human beings, we, that's sexual reproduction, through the process of meiosis. You make an egg or sperm, your partner makes the egg, another egg or sperm, whichever you don't make, and then those will reunite to make a zygote, which will grow into... Um, an embryo, and then a fetus, and then a baby. But your body also does asexual reproduction in the form of mitosis. You know, the process of your hair cells do, replicating and making more hair cells, or making more nail cells, or making more muscle cells, you do that all by yourself. So technically, you kind of have both processes going on inside of you, which is pretty cool. Four, you also have to demonstrate the ability to respond to an outside um, stimulus, or plural would be stimuli. So stimulus is a change in your organism's environment, and then the response would just be you're going to be able to react to that change. Um, so an example is sunflowers and multiple flowers grow towards the sun. So they're responding to their environment. Some flowers, like morning glories, you know, they only open up at certain times of the day and are closed during others. So they're responding to different um, changes in their environment. That's what this is referring to. Five, you have to have the ability to adapt to your environment. So populations of living things, we learned this in our evolution unit, they change over time as individuals who are better adapted live longer and therefore reproduce more. Um, thus, we know that those beneficial traits should become more common over time and species should become, or populations of a group of species, should become better adapted to their environment over time. And then last, you have to have a metabolism, meaning you can consume energy and then also produce waste. So metabolism is just a process of your body um, basically just doing cellular respiration and breaking down food in order to get energy from it. So that's what we're talking about here. And so there's this little song I heard years ago, and this is how I remember the characteristics of living things. So you sing it to the tune of Row, Row, Row Your Boat, and I am a terrible singer. So if you just want to mute this right now, go for it. If not, I'm just going to basically talk sing through this. But it goes like this. There is a high note, so just plug your ears for that part. You basically just sing, cell, cell, cells, respond, grow, and reproduce. Use energy, have DNA, adaptive living dudes. So, you have to be made of cells, you have to respond to stimulus, you have to grow and reproduce, use energy, 
have DNA or RNA, and then adapt to your environment. So those are your six traits. I want you to sing this every day to your test so that you remember the six traits of living things. All right, now, looking at all of these living things, it's necessary that we have some sort of language in order to understand how we can organize the different levels. We kind of talked through some of this stuff already. Um, so first is an organism. It is the individual member of a species or population, just one living thing. So in this picture, we just have one deer. That is one organism. Kind of the next broader level is of ecological organization is a population. This would be multiple individuals or multiple organisms of the same species living together in the same place. So all of the deer in one field would be a population of deer. Third is the community level. So this is the next broadest level. This would be all of the populations of different species living together in the same place. So all of the living things in the same place is a community. So all of the birds, deer, plants, insects, squirrels, bacteria, whatever living things exist in that field is a community. So the next level is kind of like a lateral step. It's not necessarily any bigger. It's basically just a community plus all the non-living factors in that environment. So it's the same size as a community. It's all of those living things. But we're also going to look at the non-living, the abiotic factors in that community. So we're going to look at all the deer, birds, plants, insects, etc. in the field. But we're also going to take into consideration temperature and precipitation and other things like that that are a natural disasters, just these abiotic things that, um, that go on. Then we have the biome level, and this is all multiple ecosystems that have similar characteristics but are in different parts of the planet. So they may have similar amounts of sunlight, amounts of precipitation, um, similar types of organisms that inhabit it, but we see them in different places. So these are things like grasslands and tundra and rainforest and deserts. You know, there are deserts in North America and there's deserts in Africa and there's deserts in um, Asia. So there's deserts all over the world. That would be a biome. So it's basically like ecosystems that are similar in different parts of the world. Um, we're going to do a biome activity to kind of investigate these a little bit more because they're pretty interesting. And then the biggest level and the most broad level of ecological organization is the biosphere. This is basically looking at the planet and all the living and non-living factors that are on it. So we're talking about Earth. And remember that biotic um, means living and then abiotic refers to the non-living things. Now, we can also organize life um, using taxonomy. And this is something we discussed in evolution. Remember, taxonomy is a study of classification, and it's organizing um, life, organizing these different um, organisms into species and such based on their characteristics. So remember, all life is organized into domains, um, three domains. Each of those domains is broken down into kingdoms. Kingdoms are broken down into phylums. Phylums are broken down into classes. Classes are broken down into orders. Orders are broken down into families. Families are broken down into genuses, and genuses are broken down into species. So if you share the same family, you also share the same order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. If you share the same species, all of these are the same. So they get more and more specific as we go. And I taught you during evolution um, a little, you know, acronym to remember this that I learned in my seventh grade biology class. Shout out to my teacher. Um, it's Kings play chess on funky green sidewalks. Um, that doesn't include the domain level, though. Um, I have a little acronym to remember that. It's just a little bit more morbid. So that acronym is Dumb Kids Playing Chicken on Freeways Get Smashed. <coughs> so either of those you can use to help you remember the order. But in terms of taxonomy, what's important is really this genus and species. Remember, we talked about Carlos Linnaeus, and he's the one who kind of came up with cl his classification system. But he also came up specifically with binomial nomenclature. So it is a two-name naming system that um, organizes species, uh, excuse me, 
that names organisms after their most specific classification. So we're just going to name them after their genus and species. And it's always written in italicies, and the G is always capitalized, and the S is always um, lowercase. So that's kind of what we use. Now, we have two tools that can help us classify organisms. We can look at cladograms um, that look like this. We can also look at dichotomous keys. And we can use these to um, understand relationships and also classify organisms based on their different characteristics. And we are going to practice using these um, today um, and we're going to classify some little monsters. The key thing is that whatever organism you're classifying, you always start at number one and then work your way through until you get to whatever their name is. And that is our introduction to ecology.